Hi, everyone. I'm Beverly Bond, founder of Black Girls Rock, and I am so excited to bring you another episode of the BGR Book Club in partnership with Microsoft. The BGR Book Club is designed to build and promote community, empowerment, literacy, and leadership. And each month, we select a new, inspirational, thought-provoking book for our BGR community to read and to discuss. And today, we are reading a book and discussing a book by bestseller, author, editor, student, activist, and BGR alumna, Olivia V.G. Clark. Olivia is a best-selling author. She's currently a student at University of Southern California. She's studying African-American studies uh, and East Asian languages and culture. She served as a leader on her school's diversity executive board, and she is a proud member of the 2019 and 2020 Black Girls League class, and we are so honored and so proud to have Olivia with us. Um, and she's being interviewed by another one of our BGR alumna who is also an author, um, which is exciting for us. She's a writer. She's also an activist. Um, Shanice McClo McClover Lee is an author, activist, entrepreneur, and uh, and how she's currently at Howard University. She's studying sociology and English. Uh, she joined the Black Girls Rock uh, in 2016, I believe. So she's been in BGR for a while. Um, she also, uh, in 2019, I'm not sure if many of you tune into Black Girls Rock Awards, but there's a section uh, where we honor young women under 25 who are making a difference in the community. Uh, it's called the Mad Girl Awards, and Shanice is actually the 2019 Mad Girl Award recipient. Uh, for her advoc advocacy and activism work. So we're super excited to have her here. Um, she's also a baker, uh, and I don't, she didn't have that in her bio, but I just wanted to share that because she, she made me some vegan cupcakes from her bakery, and I was so excited about that. Um, she will be with us in a minute, but I want to welcome Olivia to the stage. Olivia, welcome and thank you. Hello, thank you so much for having me. We are so excited to have you here. And, and, and I know that Olivia is going to be interviewing you before she gets started. Um, I wanted to ask you a couple of questions about the book because I know that there are some other contributing uh, editors in the book who are also uh, BGR alum and some who are not, of course. So I wanted you to just kind of shine a light on other people who contributed to the book. So the book is an anthology. Um, I wrote about half and about half is written by 16 other girls and women, um, all ranging from, at the time, from eighth grade to adulthood. Uh, mm -hmm. There are also five other grown women who wrote uh, Thrive Tips in the book. And so the 16 other uh, contributors have written stories, poems, anecdotes, essays, about their experiences in predominantly white institutions as black girls. Uh, there are a couple of other Black Girls Rock alumni, including my little sister, like actual little sister, um, and Amina Aliu. And so that was also really great being able to work with some of my fellow BGR alumni. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so 16 other amazing authors. Some are friends of mine that from my high school. Uh, but they range from all across the country. And now everyone is either in high school or has graduated. You know, it's funny. I, I don't think I mentioned the title of the book. I was so busy talking about you. I forgot, <laughs> I forgot to mention. It's called uh, uh, Black Girl, White Schools, Don't Touch My Hair. Mm -hmm. Black okay. Girl, White School, Thriving, Surviving, and No, You Can't Touch My Hair. Mm, yes, thank you very much. I didn't have a copy of the book in front of me. Can you pull it up, actually? <laughs> so we can see it, or if, if the, um, the team could put it on screen, that'd be great. Uh, I actually, oh, here we go. <laughs> okay. Oh, good. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't find my book. Okay. That's, that's pretty awesome. So um, can you talk about the process? Because I did something very similar with my book, um, uh, Black Girls Rock, Own Era, Magic, Rocking Our Truth, in terms of making it an anthology um, uh, or a... A, a narrative based book where I interviewed a whole bunch of people and then had to uh, actually turn that into narrative. Um, so can you tell me your process? Because 
I think everyone's is different, but I think that there is a lot of value in hearing from writers and authors themselves about mm -hmm. how to actually write a book. So the idea originally came to me the end portion of my sophomore year. Um, for context, I'm a freshman in college. Wow. And so I, it's been a long time and I can't believe it's been that long. Um, so I was walking with my mom one day after school because I lived really close to my high school. And mm -hmm. I had mentioned to her that I had just off the cuff idea. That someone should write a book about like how to survive a predominantly white school as a black girl because I was thinking about how much that would have been useful for me. And at the time I worked at my school's after hours program. So I was around a lot of really young kids of color that would be there waiting after school. And I saw how it affected them. For me, I didn't end up going to a PWI until I was a sixth grader. But mm -hmm. the girls I was working with were as young as four because my mm -hmm. school started pretty early. Um, and so I was like, yeah, it'd be great if someone could just, you know, write a little guide or something like that. And my mom stopped me and told me to do it instead. <laughs> and I so that. I ended up uh, kind of sitting on that for a little bit um, as I had a problem with procrastination. <laughs> um, <laughs> but then probably around the beginning of my junior year, I started really fleshing out the idea. And so it started out with me just thinking, how much have I learned over the last couple of years? Um, and what did I wish I had known that first day of school? And so I started off with creating categories. And so that's the way the book is set up. It's set up into different sections or different topics. And so I came up with the topics first and started listing out things that I wanted to cover and make sure I had. And so then I ended up writing introductions to each of the chapters, so to say. And then after that, I started out by reaching out to girls in my school mm -hmm. and then girls through Instagram uh, that I'd met from conferences like Black Girls Rock mm -hmm. um, or Black Girls Lead. And it really started to pick up steam more than I expected. And so I used a Google form because that was the easiest thing I could come up <laughs> with. And it had the title of the book. Uh, who I was, what my dreams and goals for said book were, and then it had a place where you could put your information, a file with your entry, and which section you would prefer it to be under. And so I had that going while I was promoting on pretty much any platform I could get my hands on, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, reaching out to anyone I knew, and did that for a couple of months. And then after that, I was able to get luckily a really good amount of entries and I had to go through the entries read all of them choose which ones I thought would fit in this book which ones wouldn't which ones I wanted to save maybe for the next one and reach out to them again later and that took maybe two weeks I think for me to go through all of them and choose them and then after that it was really just the editing portion so I was able to really make some connections with the other uh, authors in the book as well. And so the next several months was just back and forth between me editing, maybe editing their passage, reaching out, saying, making sure that it wasn't changing their message, mm -hmm. um, letting them know, uh, contracts, things like that. And then choosing the book cover, which was probably the hardest thing because I knew it was the first thing people were gonna see. Mm -hmm. And the entire process took about a year, a little over a year. Mm. Um, and it went from the beginning of junior year to it being published in August of my senior year. So yeah, it was a really, I didn't expect it to be so difficult. I mm -hmm. think I went into it with just bright eyed, bushy tail, just excited to do the idea. Right. And eventually I learned writing a book is really hard. Oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> It's very difficult. Um, however, it was extremely fun and really fulfilling. And I've loved what I've been able to do because of it. So, yeah. And it's, it, so you're saying that, um, and I think it's important what you're sharing because the process of that discipline that you have to go through um, while you're doing it, you don't 
you know, it becomes daunting. However, um, I think people do need to understand, and especially young people who are now becoming um, a lot of more entrepreneurs out here, um, but the process and the time uh, that it takes to um, go from start to completion, um, that is where the magic lives. The magic lives in the process, right? It's like people think, the finished product and they, they see you arrive, but they don't understand that the the process is really where you're strengthening yourself. That's where your superpowers lie. So I love that you're sharing that that part of it. Um, it is it is really um, also a life changing thing, right? When you actually can complete something like that. Tell me about how you feel it has empowered you from going from just having an idea and being bright eyed and bushy tailed to completing it and just like, oh, like, you know, I rock, <laughs> you know? And what did that inspire you to feel that you could do from that point? I definitely think going through the process of writing the book is one of the most empowering things I've ever done because it showed me what I can achieve. It showed me what I was capable of. Uh, Because there were definitely points when I was writing it when I would hit writer's block or I would get frustrated with, Mm -hmm. you know, publishing processes or something like that. And I'd be like, not having the best time. Um, But that perseverance that I had to have in order to see the finished product, it's it's my favorite thing I've done so far. And I'm hoping that I can continue to make more favorite things. Um, I'm only 18, so I have some time. (laughs) But... (laughs) so far it's my favorite thing it's my pride and joy of everything I've ever done um it was very like I said it was very difficult and I think it was especially difficult because I was doing it at a time where I was also applying to colleges and doing things like that but it also proved to me the importance of focusing on my goals focusing on my dreams and even as, if it's not necessarily in the traditional timeline or order, that's still worth it. Because um, originally when I thought about it, I was like, oh, I could write this, you know, like after high school or, you know, maybe later in life. But taking that first step to go ahead and do it at the time was really important. I love it. And I know that Shanice is going to come in and I don't want to step on her toes because she's going to be interviewing you. But I did want to ask a little bit about your experience. Um, One of the things that I when I uh, wrote my narrative in my book, I also talked about going to different schools. Right. I was moved around a lot. So I went to. um, In fact, I talk about this a little bit in the Microsoft uh, Museum. If you haven't seen it, everyone, please go look to look at the Microsoft Virtual Museum. It's really cool. And um, they actually feature me in there. And I talk about just moving around a lot and going to different schools. Um, But I don't I didn't talk about specifically my experience in predominantly white schools. Um, But I do talk about it in my book. And so I was really interested in your experience. But for me, um, I not I, I I had very uh, specific observations um, in those spaces, but I would love to hear about what what it was specifically that made you like how you saw girls affected to make you want to write this. So I moved from a I'm from Columbus, Ohio. Uh, I yeah. moved from a predominantly black uh, elementary school to a family white school that went anywhere from, you know, three years old to us graduating high school. And so I really didn't think too much about how it was affecting other kids up until I started talking about it in like diversity clubs and things like that, moving into high school. So despite there being plenty of other girls, as it was an all-girls school, Plenty of other girls that experienced what I did, I really did feel alone. Um, So then moving into high school, when I started doing diversity work and getting really involved in my school in that aspect, was when I started talking to, you know, my friends, my peers, the uh, older girls I was close to. And I realized that many of us were having these same experiences and not necessarily talking about it um, or waiting until we were much older to talk about it. So moving forward, I, when I hit that point, when I was in sophomore year and really came up with the idea for the book, it was based in 
looking, having those talks with the older girls, with my friends, and looking at the younger girls that would then start coming to me to talk about it. And so Mm -hmm. I really started seeing things like poor self-esteem. I went through a phase in middle school where I genuinely wished that I was white because those, Mm. that was who I saw. That was who was my teachers. That was who were, those were the popular girls. Those were everyone I saw at school that I looked up to at the time were pretty much white. Um, And it was, middle school is awful point blank (laughs) and so it was really difficult already dealing with self-esteem issues as an adolescent uh adding that portion on top of it and so mainly things like self-esteem issues uh being left out of events uh social events specifically um also just things like not having access things really simple like oh it was a swimming day and we're not allowed to have time to do our hair. And so we're just mm. rushed out. And everyone's like, hey, we need a little bit more time than just the blow dryer or the hair or the, what is it called? The hand dryer to do our hair. Mm. And so really cataloging those experiences of others is what uh, really sparked my idea. Um, wow, I love that. Well, Shanice has just joined us, and I am going to pass this over to her. Uh, Shanice, I already introduced you. Um, I hope you did well on your test. Our girls are rocking so hard. They're still in school while they're doing all this, so I love it. Um, but I'm going to pass this on over to you. And now this is your interview. I'll see you guys after that workshop. Okay. Hi, everyone. Hi, Olivia. I'm so glad I get to have this conversation with you. First, I want to congratulate you on your book. I breezed through it. I really enjoyed it. I read it in one sitting, and I resonated with so many of the stories. I know you probably mentioned, um, I think I got in where you were talking a bit about how you came up for the idea of the book. Um, that's what. That's where you were, right? Just so I can yes. know. Like, <laughs> yes, I discovered that. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So I wanted to know, um, aside from, you know, where you got your inspiration from the book, what really stood out to me the most were the vulnerable stories that you shared. Like, I remember you were talking about one specific experience where you were at lunch and someone held up a piece of broccoli and compared it to your hair and things like that. Like, how do you... How did you get the confidence and courage to share such vulnerable parts um, of your experiences, you know, even while they were difficult? Writing the book definitely opened up some old wounds that I had thought <laughs> had healed uh, a long time ago. Um, writing it was a very vulnerable process for me, and it I think it really helped me grow as both like as a person and as a writer Mm -hmm. because while I was thinking about these stories at first it was it was almost like opening a floodgate of memories a lot of these things I had just decided like oh it wasn't that big of a deal and just had kind of shut away and forgotten about um until I was like oh I need an example of da 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 I was like oh yeah that happened that actually was a big deal. Um, and it did affect me. And so, first of all, it was just me opening up to myself again um, and trying not to get rid of the bad habit of just packing things away and shoving them deep down and being like, it's fine, just moving them over to the side. Uh, but what really allowed me to have that courage to share it with like a wider audience was just the fact that I knew speaking about these stories in a smaller bubble, like with the younger girls at my school had helped them. And so the goal first and foremost was always, I just wanted to help as many people as possible, or even just provide, you know, support or a camaraderie, friendship, anything I could so that people reading the book could understand that they weren't alone. And I knew in order to do that, I needed to be vulnerable myself and give examples of why they weren't alone. And so, yeah, like you said, the burnt piece of broccoli story, um, which for anyone who hasn't read the book yet, essentially I was at lunch in middle school and just joking around as usual. And I was already not in a good mood that day, I remember. 
And I used to always wear my hair in a, like an Afro puff. And I remember someone made a joke and they held up uh, just like a regular piece of broccoli. And they're like, this looks like your hair. And everyone's ha 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 or whatever. And it was mildly irritating, but you know, I just kind of let it go until people from other lunch tables started coming over to discuss the fact that my head looked like a piece of broccoli until one girl came across who I honestly didn't know that well and went, no, this one looks more like her and held up a burnt piece of broccoli. And I honestly took it. It took a minute for me to remember what my reaction was. Um, But I just remember getting up from the table table silently and just leaving lunch and going back to like lunch was on the lower level and just going back upstairs where uh the classes were and then a little bit later I remember getting text messages from my friends asking where I was and I actually had a friend come up to me and tell me like that I was overreacting that they were just joking that I was taking it too far and making it awkward for everyone and that was the end of it And so I remember never actually being able to stand up for myself at the time. Um, I didn't have necessarily the vocabulary, uh, which was another thing that I wanted to provide in the book was the vocabulary to explain what these were, these microaggressions or macroaggressions in that case, (laughs) so that people could, you know, express themselves in a way that I was not able to. And so, yeah, did I answer your question? It was basically just to make sure that I could help others Mm -hmm. One of the things you mentioned was how, as you were thinking about this experience, you kind of just, you know, made it your default mechanism to push the story and what happened to you out of your mind. And while I was reading this book, that's kind of um, what happened to me. Like I grew up in um, predominantly white neighborhoods and I also went to predominantly white schools as well. I had a very similar accident happen to me when I was in middle school at lunch too. So some very, you know, similar. I don't know what it is right. about things happening. Something lunch about middle the, school lunch. <laughs> I, I don't know what it is, but especially when you are a black girl in a predominantly white environment, it's just, you know, I guess the dynamics of um, our surroundings. And I remember that similar to what you said, you kind of just got up and removed yourself from the situation. And I did the same thing. And that made me think about how as black girls and young black women, we oftentimes go through these situations where we know that what the other person is saying is wrong. But if we react and kind of like have an outburst, we're going to be seen as, you know, kind of like your friend said, you were overreacting when you were essentially calm and just removed yourself from the situation. But how do you react it another way? Like, how do you outwardly express your anger? and showed that you were upset about how other people were treating you, you probably would have been seen as like, you know, the aggressor in the situation when you were actually the victim. So why do you think it is that that is our default mechanism to kind of just brush things aside, even when we know that something wrong is being done to us? I think it probably relies on two things. Um, At least it did for me. The first thing was, I knew, like you said, if I were to show any sort of emotion, it would be taken as aggression first, rather than hurt or, you know, being the victim. Um, Even removing myself from the situation, I was still put in the wrong. And so being quiet, being just kind of like, I'll just deal with it internally later prevents having to have that blowback, which then adds a whole nother layer. Because it's one thing to be upset, and then it's another thing to be upset and to be told that you're overreacting or that you made it up in your head or that you're crazy for feeling the way that you're feeling. And then the second thing is I definitely used it as a defense mechanism just from my own thoughts. If I were to say, oh, it wasn't that big of a deal, then there was no struggle. There was no reason for me to think about it longer. If I was able to say, oh, this was just a joke, it didn't really matter. Nothing, nothing really mattered. And just shove it down. Then I could move on and go on to the next thing without having to deal with that hurt and process it. And the processing of that grief that you have as a young black girl of constantly being battered and pushed around and things like that is difficult. It's difficult. And it's not, and it's honestly something that when I was younger, I thought was just going to magically disappear when I got older. Like I was going to turn 18, become an adult. And all my problems would disappear. 
it didn't happen, unfortunately. <laughs> um, but I, I just, I remember thinking if I get up and walk away, then it will just magically disappear. And that's really what it was. Just if I push it down, it'll magically disappear, which is not true. And I know that now. Um, and like I said before, with the vocabulary now, that I do have the vocabulary and a deeper understanding of who I am and these experiences and the history behind these experiences, it's easier for me to stand up for myself or stand up for others or bring something up in the moment. And I've also learned how to navigate these conversations uh, around two main points. I know how to navigate these situations and I'm used to the different types of reactions that I may receive. So it's no longer uh, a sort of place of anxiety for me as I know, okay, one of a couple things might happen. I might get called aggressive or tell I'm overreacting. Hopefully uh, that won't happen and I'll be listened to. Maybe it'll be a mix of both. And secondly, now in the stage that I am in my life, it's not that I don't care about being seen as the aggressor, but I know that in my uh, experiences in diversity, equity, and inclusion work, it's inevitable. It will happen at some point and probably multiple times and it will continue to occur. And so knowing that almost that it's inevitable, which is kind of a depressing thing to realize, has removed some of that pressure from me to constantly uh, tone police myself in order to appease other people. Mm -hmm. And one of the um, recurring themes, not just in your story, but within the stories of the other girls that were included in the book, was an attack against our self-esteem, whether it be the color of our skin, mm -hmm. our hair, our man mannerisms. What are some things that you have kind of had to unlearn as a result of, you know, the different um, negative experiences that you had growing up and being in predominantly white environments as a young black girl? Um, I mentioned earlier that in my middle school year, specifically like sixth and seventh grade, uh, I had a phase or a period of time where I did wish that I was white. And that was probably the biggest attack to my self-esteem that I've ever experienced in my life because that desire to be white goes literally against everything I am. <laughs> it is impossible. There is no way I'm going to magically become 15 shades lighter and my hair will stop being 4C and go to 1A. Like it's, it's just not any kind of achievable goal. And so constantly working towards a goal that it not only is impossible, but forces you to change every aspect of your being, at least physically is extremely damaging. And it's really difficult to not only go through, but then get over. And so I really didn't start making that transition into security in my blackness until maybe eighth grade freshman year. And the thing that really is, I wanna stress an importance on is in elementary school or when I was growing up, this was never an issue. I grew up in a very black, beautiful household. I grew up with, you know, and my living room just has shelves full of my Angela books and, and books with little black girls and little black boys in it. And so I had the support. I had the home support. I had the background. I had the parents. My parents met at their, like my cultural club. Like it was never supposed to be an issue. Mm -hmm. But then being put in that uh, environment, as a young adolescent, there really is no way to make sure that that won't happen. Um, as you don't really realize, you can't experience someone else's life for them. And so it was just an internal struggle that I really had to work on um, by myself. And part of the reason that I was able to and, and I've heard from not just black kids, but also, you know, kids of color that this is a common experience that kids have in their adolescence um, when they grow up in a predominantly white space. And building my self-esteem is what ended it. I'm really realizing that I'm beautiful without having to look like 
my friend Michaela. You know, like I don't have to change who I am to fit someone else. Mm-hmm. And that my, their beauty is not my lack, essentially. And so even now, you know, I, part of the reason I am able to stay so confident and secure in myself is just my constant building of my own self-esteem. Um, whether that be, you know, every morning when I wake up and, you know, walk out of my dorm room, go to the hallway where my bathroom is, um, I like to take time in the morning just to appreciate myself, which to some people may sound kind of narcissistic <laughs> or conceited, <laughs> but it really is just, you know, taking care of myself, doing self-care is important. And it's not conceited and it's not narcissistic because it's important for you to love yourself. It's very difficult to operate on any level when you have poor self-esteem. And so that's something that I really want to stress to young Black girls or young Black boys struggling is to focus on your self-esteem, raise that. And life, honestly, got so much easier for me when it did. Um, or when I did, when I raised my self-esteem. So that definitely was a process. And it took a bit. It took probably from eighth grade to maybe the beginning of my sophomore year for me to really get to the place where I am now. And I'm still learning as I grow. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of times when specifically Black girls share our experiences growing up in predominantly white environments that no one really knows just how much work it takes to unlearn like the years and years of the things that you were taught to not like about yourself. So I don't think it's narcissistic at all that you take time to appreciate yourself every day because it's really, you know, the little things that you do to just to make sure that you are okay and that you're secure in yourself. So now that you're environment is different you know you're out of middle school and high school what is you know being at USC like you are still in a predominantly white environment but a lot of times you know as we get older it's easier to find community with other black students so you know what is your experience been like so far my process in choosing a college was particularly difficult because I didn't know whether I wanted to go to a PWI again. If I wanted to go to an HBCU, uh, Howard and Spelman were definitely two of my very top choices. Um, As being able to have that experience of living in a predominantly Black environment and having that support from people that look like me every day was really something I dreamed of. Uh, Eventually, I did end up choosing USC, which was not only a big jump, because I went from high school to college, but I also moved completely across the country by myself. Um, Mm -hmm. As I'm from Ohio and now I'm in LA, which is never somewhere I thought I would be able to say I was living. (laughs) Um, But USC definitely has its issues as all schools do in general, Um, but also PWIs. But one thing that really, really I am very grateful for Um, I live in a place called Somerville, which Somerville place, let me back up. USC has a lot of different uh, places you can live Mm -hmm. that are like cultural floors or cultural buildings. And so they have one for like Asian Pacific Islanders, uh, Latino kids, black kids, um, et cetera. And so I live in the, on the black floor or floors in my dorm. And so I was able to have that opportunity to choose to come back home every day to a place full of my friends and my peers that look like me, that are sharing similar experiences with me every day. And I met my very best friends so far, you know, here. And it's been very, very helpful. And it really just had stressed the importance of finding a community no matter where you are. And it is a difficult thing to do if it's not explicitly like, apply for housing. Do you want to live with your community? That was really easy. And it was something I was very grateful for. Um, but even when, you know, it's not necessarily college or living, whether it's, you know, a work environment or you're still in middle school or high school or elementary school, even clubs outside extracurriculars, I cannot stress the importance of finding a community and finding a safe space um, because the world is hard. 
and I'm starting to learn that even more as I continue to grow. Adulthood is, it's fun, but it's very difficult. And now I'm starting to understand my parents a little bit more every day and they're proving to be right every day. <laughs> I um, Being able to come home, I mean, I'm in my dorm room currently. My best friend is my roommate, which is the best living situation you could possibly have, being best friends with your roommate. Um, and being best friends with my floor is just an amazing thing. So, and also joining BSA, the Black Student Association, that's very useful. Every Monday they have meetings, we get to go have fun, have discussions, um, join really anything that you want. Make sure you join clubs that not only focus on your cultural identity, but also other identities you have. I'm also a part of uh, the, like it's, basically the feminism club so I get to go there every week and work with them and it is just despite USC being predominantly white I mean the administrators are almost all white most of the teachers are white the campus is uh, a good amount white my class my freshman class is actually 73 give or take percent students of color but that's the biggest percentage they've ever had mm -hmm. um and so just finding somewhere where I can go and just be myself and be comfortable was extremely important to me. And so I do, I do have times where I wonder, what would life have been like if I did commit to Howard or if I did end up going to Spelman? And honestly, I have no idea. I can't turn back time and tell the future. <laughs> um, but I am very happy with my decision as I am now because I was able to come and live in such a great place. Mm -hmm. And I think you really hit it right on the nail. Like that is the importance, the, the importance of finding community, like no matter where you are. And I think a lot of times specifically for, you know, black girls or black youth in general who grow up in predominantly white environments when it gets to college, that is a really difficult decision because my own personal decision to go to Howard was largely influenced that, you know, I grew up in predominantly white environments. But like you said, I oftentimes think about, you know, what would have happened if I would have, you know, committed to the PWI that gave me a full ride and like, what would my life have been like? And I think, you know, outside of hypothesizing about this, it's all, it all boils down to just finding community and finding people who make you, you know, feel good about yourself. So now, not, not to rewind a little bit, but I thought, I thought about something I also wanted to ask. Um, now that you look back on, you know, your high school years and your middle school years, do you see anything different that is being done, you know, actively being done to protect Black students, to make sure that, you know, some of the things that happened to you are not happening to other students of color currently? I can definitely say there is a big difference even from my sixth grade year to now and the amount of diversity, equity and inclusion discussions I see happening, you know, in schools with students as well as with administrators and things like that. Uh, in middle school, I didn't see any of that at all. My friends that went to other PWIs didn't see that. It just now part of that could have been that it was middle school. A lot of those discussions don't even just start until you're already in leadership as a senior in high school. And it seems like you're working behind the scenes instead of having these conversations openly with the entire school. Um, but I definitely see that it's been, it's increasing. It's increasing. Is it where it should be? No, <laughs> it's not. Um, but it, we're working on it. Um, I will say a lot of, there are a couple of things that as these talks continue to be had, certain points where it's lacking, I've noticed that a lot of times these discussions, when they're held in schools, specifically high schools and middle schools, are student-led, which is amazing on one hand because, you know, we're getting student involvement. These are the kids that are actually experiencing these things, and it's important to have their voices be heard. But see a lot of times that leading into the heavy lifting only being done by students which is not where it should be held. It is the administrator's responsibility to create a safe space 
not the students to have to fight for it constantly and continuously, you know, be vulnerable in spaces they might not feel comfortable in order to get this done. And so that's one thing I definitely wish I would see less of, um, just pushing the hard work on kids instead of the adults that actually are the ones creating the curriculum and signing the papers and, ha and doing the funding. Um, I think as we move forward, I would like to see more of these conversations starting earlier. Now, we don't need to sit in front of a five-year-old and be like, quick, tell me the history of systemic racism. That's not a thing because they're five. But having age-appropriate discussions because these experiences don't magically pop up when you're 13, 14. These are experiences I've seen with really little kids. Uh, going back to my work at After Hours at my old school, there are many times where I would have kids would be comparing themselves, as they do, just observing the world and themselves. And someone, one girl specifically, always made a point to make sure that she, people knew that she wasn't brown. She would go, I'm not brown, I'm tan. She was Persian, I believe, and she was adopted um, into a white family. Mm -hmm. And I just remember every time I would come across them, she would try to make sure that no one called her brown, that everyone made sure she was tan or that she said that they were, she said that she was light, um, which is heartbreaking to hear, like a five-year-old say, because already you're, she was not proud of what she looked like. And also just things like having to not break up fights because they're little, but like making sure like, hey, we don't say that about our friends or we don't touch our friends without permission. Having girls come to me saying, they keep touching my hair because they people would, the kids would just come up and just start tugging on, you know, their braids or whatever they happen to have in their head at that day. And so if we began these conversations earlier, just with simple things like, we know you have to, you teach kids ask before you take their toy. We also need to teach kids, ask before you say something like <laughs> aggressive about someone's appearance. Don't say that. Or like ask before you touch them or ask just consent in general is really important as well. Mm -hmm. And so looking at that, uh, so that's a main thing that I want to start working on is just starting these conversations earlier. So outside of, you know, taking the initiative to have these important conversations to just put it in everyone's minds that, you know, there's an issue that we need to change. What, you know, what does actively showing up for Black girls look like to you? Like if you had, you know, the power to create the specific changes, you know, within your old middle school and high school, like what would that look like to you if you could, you know, change things however you wanted? One thing that I would strongly recommend, which we implemented my senior year at my high school, were affinity spaces, um, which are essentially identity based, not necessarily race, it could be religion, uh, sexual orientation, anything of that sort, spaces where you go and it's only people that identify with you. And so, mm -hmm. one reason that those spaces are really important is because there is no need to necessarily explain a topic if say we're talking about microaggressions against black girls in a black girl affinity space if i say an experience i won't have to then explain why that experience hurt me or give examples elsewhere there's no need to explain yourself because you're able to just talk with people that already understand your experience or are already going through what you are going through and it doesn't necessarily have to be negative it's also a celebration space um, so that's something that's really important. Also looking at curriculum, what are you teaching? Is black history only taught in February? Because black history, specifically black American history is American history. It should be included throughout the year, uh, making sure that when we do have these discussions about black trauma, we're not re-traumatizing kids showing traumatic images, um, traumatic videos of violence against black bodies is not necessary to understand the weight of a situation. Um, and I see that a lot also, not even just in schools, but also 
what are you sharing on, on social media when issues of police brutality show up? Are you reposting these videos consistently without any sort of warning? Are you doing things that are taxing on Black mental health? And also things like self-reflection. Not only, you know, anti-Blackness is not something that we only see in predominantly white spaces. We see in other communities as well. Not even necessarily, you know, race-based communities. And so looking at how you interact with Black people, even simple things like, oh, you're talking to a Black girl. Have you changed the way you're speaking? Are you suddenly using AAVE, which is African-American vernacular English um, for anyone who does not know, which is essentially a dialect. I believe it's considered a dialect currently um, that is common in the way African-Americans speak and it changes depending on you know, the region. And so just being self-aware and having those points of self-reflection an important thing uh, about allyship is that it is difficult and you're not going to be perfect the first time or maybe even ever, but it's the work that you put in, which is important. Um, having an opening ear, a listening ear, letting, it's easy to get defensive when you are critiqued. Um, but in instances of allyship, it's important to take that critique without being defensive. And one thing that is very, very important and very useful, both as an ally and to communities you're being an ally to, but the Black community in general, is research, doing research on your own. Um, attending events like these, keep coming to these, please keep coming to these <laughs> VGR book talks. <laughs> um, doing things where you reach out to figure out, to learn about topics on your own. As you know, something we see commonly written on the internet is Google is free and it is taxing. Um, as a black person to consistently have to explain the history of your trauma or the history of anything to people that have, are perfectly able to do it themselves. So those are a couple of things that I would say are really mm -hmm. useful. So looking back at your experiences as a whole, do you think that, you know, you would be who you are today and passionate about the things that you are currently passionate about had you not gone through everything that you went through? I like this question because I, I ask myself this question all the time. I do a lot of, hmm, I wonder what... If. One thing, there are a couple instances in my life that I consider catalysts for how the rest of my life played out. And one of the main ones was the moving from my elementary school to the PWI, where I um, attended from middle school to high school. And I have a very specific memory of maybe a week or two before school started. There were always, you know, new girl mixers or times you could come into school and, you know, meet the teachers, meet continuing students so that you didn't feel so like overwhelmed when you showed up the first day. And I remember having a conversation with, uh, it was me, my parents, and probably the best teacher I've ever had, um, Mr. Burton. Mr. Burton was the only black male teacher that my school had ever had. And they haven't hired one since. He worked there from the 1980s until my sixth grade year was his uh, last year, actually. And he was a sixth grade teacher, so we got to have him last. Um, and he really influenced the way the rest of my life played out. And he would come back and substitute teacher a little bit um, until he passed away a couple years ago. Uh, but having him as a role model he told me something one day after we had elections, like school elections, and I had run for sports representative. And I remember after I gave my speech and after everyone voted, um, he pulled me aside and he told me that he was proud of me and that I would always have to work twice as hard as the other girls in my grade, but that I was capable of it and that I was able to do it. And I honestly think that experience right there really 
changed my life having him as a mentor as a teacher and so honestly if I had to you know another question I asked myself is would I change would I have decided not to go in hindsight if I was able to turn back the clock and the answer is honestly no not because I would ever want to relive um some of those traumatic experiences I had but because they provided me with a certain amount of hindsight is helpful. Having those experiences in my belt helps me to do my work. It helps me to move through life. It helps me to do events like these where hopefully I'm able to help other kids that are already in that beginning stages of what I went through. And so if I was able to go back, I wouldn't change anything. I think my life has been good and it's, and overall, despite the trials and tribulations, <laughs> it's who, it's what made me who I am. And it's what's provided me the opportunity to be able to help other people. Yes, I, I definitely, I ask myself that question all the time as well, which is why I wanted to ask you that. Um, I think a lot of times, you know, when we do have these experiences, it serves as a catalyst for us to be, you know, the wonderful, amazing people that we are. But I do wish that as Black black girls who are now young Black women that we didn't have to necessarily experience, you know, traumatic things for it to kind of be the building block for us to be the amazing women that we are today. So I, you know, commend you for everything that you're doing, your commitment to showing up for Black women and girls, and I hope you continue to do amazing things, and I will be cheering you on. Thank you so much. You guys hear me? That was amazing, ladies. Thank you so much. And I know we're about to go to our workshop portion of this. Um, there's so many things that, uh, honestly, um, I relate to with what you guys were talking about. And I think we all do as black girls. So I'm glad to see that there's finally conversation and dialogue and actionable items around having us, um, really, um, recognize that this is, this has been a way in which black girls have had to exist for so long, um, in schools and especially in predominantly white schools, but you know, in society in general. So I love the conversation. Uh, before we go to the workshop, I just want to make some announcements and thank uh, Microsoft, of course, for uh, powering this book club. Um, our next uh, month's book uh, will uh, book club date will be March the 16th um, at 9 a.m. Pacific and 12 p.m. Eastern. Uh, the book is called Star Child, a biological constellation of Octavia Estelle Butler. In addition, um, we are going to rebroadcast this uh, conversation on Saturday on our YouTube channel. So uh, you should be getting information about that on the screen. Um, and uh, let's go to workshop. Thank you. All right, awesome. So hello everyone again. Uh, today, I will be leading our workshop, um, which is going to be actually based in affirmations. And so, first, uh, we talked a little bit earlier about you know the importance of self-care and checking in with yourself. So I want to start off with that. So we have a, uh, a couple of self-care questions. And these are um, questions that I have in the pairing journal. There are actually two journals that pair with the book. Uh, one that is just the main one, and that one's meant for Black girls. And the second is an allyship journal. And so you can find this one in the main journal. And so it starts off with, how do you feel today? Uh, what type of support do you need from who? What do you need right now? What words do you need to hear right now? And so these are a couple of questions. I definitely recommend you to ask yourself doing you know, daily check-ins with yourself. Uh, maybe you forget, not daily does it have to be, but you know, every once in a while, checking in with your mind, your body, your spirit, seeing how you're sitting. I like to do these each morning just to see, you know, what headspace I'm in, what I need, whether or not I might, you know, adjust maybe my schedule for the day to make room if I, you know, need a little extra space. Uh, 
this morning when I asked myself, how do you feel today? The anxious, the, excuse me, the answer was anxious. I was a little anxious about this event, despite it being amazing. Um, but, you know, it's always a little nerve wracking when you're on camera. So after you ask yourselves those questions, uh, moving on to affirmations. So I believe affirmations are extremely important. Uh, I believe in speaking things into existence. And so affirmations are one of those ways that you can do it. So self-affirmations are essentially statements that you can say, you know, almost sort of like a mantra um, that you can, you know, adjust from day to day, depending on what you need. Uh, but going back to building self-esteem, one of the ways I did it was just saying things that I didn't necessarily believe at the time. Like, for example, I am beautiful, I am strong, I am capable. Saying these things, while it may seem silly at first, really helped me to build myself back up from that time period where really my focus was self-deprecation. And this is quite literally the opposite of that. And so I used to focus a lot on making, you know, jokes at my own expense, um, focusing on negatives, focusing on things that I truly like disliked about myself. That as, you know, humor is a coping mechanism as, you know, funny as it might be at the time, really does have long-term effects on the way you view yourself. Uh, because if you're constantly focusing on things like, oh, you know, not the prettiest or saying off the cuff, you know, self-deprecating remarks like that, you start to believe them. And so today we're going to be writing five self-affirmations or more. If you can get more, I definitely recommend more. You can create a list of them that you then, you know, choose out of, write where you need them and continue on like that. All right, so there are three main uh, types of affirmations that I want to cover today. Uh, so the first type is empowerment affirmations. And so specifically for this event, I would like uh, the focus for empowerment affirmations to be on young Black kids or young kids of color. And so these are affirmations that will help you believe in yourself, essentially. They do what they're called, they're empowerment affirmations. And so we have a couple of examples on the screen, like I am enough, I am grounded in myself, I am love, I am bright, I am joyful, I am beautiful. And so while you say these, I genuinely used to laugh when I would when I started <laughs> making affirmations because it just sounded silly, like why am I talking to myself? Um, but I recommend taking these and writing them down and putting them somewhere where you see them often. So, I mean, I'm in a dorm right now, so... I have a communal bathroom and can't necessarily put a sticky note on the middle of the mirror. Um, but, you know, I have a couple hanging over top of, in front of me is my desk and then like a wall space. I have some hanging there since I do my schoolwork here. Um, so I would recommend putting them there. Put them on your computer if you're there and uh, You can even use it as your phone background, on, set it up on a cork board next to your bed, anywhere where you'll see it often enough for you to start letting it sit with you and change them out every once in a while. It doesn't need to be the same thing. Uh, the second type is allyship affirmations. And so we talked a little bit about this earlier. So allyship is difficult. Being an ally is not easy work. It's being a true ally is not easy work. When you move past, you know, maybe things that would be considered performative and you put in the work, it's taxing because you're already dealing with your own issues. You're dealing with your own issues in your community and yourself. And then adding that extra step of being there for another community, learning about something that you don't experience necessarily, or that you don't, you weren't born into is difficult. And so it's completely okay to make affirmations about that as well. Uh, examples we have, I can put in the work. I'm strong enough to call out my friends and family. Things like that are difficult. It's already hard navigating relationships. It's a whole other thing when you're navigating relationships where you're having to comment on or maybe call out someone on a behavior they have that doesn't necessarily affect you because then you may get hit with things like, why do you care? Like You're not, insert identity here. Things like that are difficult. So I definitely recommend these as well. 
And the third and final affirmation example for the day is leadership examples. Uh, for the purpose of this context, I use these mostly for you know administrators, um, whether they're people of color or not. But dealing with your own adult life, or even if you're not an adult, dealing with your own issues and then adding that on top, being a leader or a, uh, a protector, a guidance counselor, anything of that kind of sort for people that, may necess- that need you, for people that need you is difficult. And so examples we have here are like, I can heal my inner trauma. I can set aside my inner trauma. Healing inner trauma is going to take a very long time. I'm not saying that it's going to be like, okay, I fixed it and you can push it aside, but it is something that you may have to use or even set aside for a portion of time um, in a situation in order to help kids. And so I, I am the right person to fight for these kids is also one of the examples. And so my affirmations I, I wrote this morning, um, if I pull them up, were I'm calm, I'm grounded, I'm fully capable, I'm confident and forgiving of myself. And so I use those to prepare for my for this event this morning. Uh, those are my four or five. I'm not sure how many I said, but doing those even when you're preparing for things, it doesn't necessarily have to be for a whole day. It can be for one specific event. And so I would love for everyone watching this uh, to come up with around five affirmations. Um, if you're able to, please share them in the chat. Send them here so we can read them out loud, so we can support each other. Um, and really just share them around because, you know, one that might work for you, it's very likely that it'll work for someone else as well. And so I would also, while you write those, I'll continue talking about them. And so the reason why affirmations are so useful besides speaking them into existence is because repetition. Repetition alone is very useful. Um, as I talked about Mr. Burton, my mentor before, that was one thing that he always talked about. Now, now, normally he was talking about memorizing science facts, but <laughs> he put an emphasis on repetition and that's something that I carried with in my life. If you know, you continue to repeat these affirmations, repeat things that you want to come true. I know something that probably a lot of you have seen on the internet as of recent, Especially, I mean, the sort of things I've been saying is like the power of manifestation. Um, thinking about just putting things into your life that you want to take out of it. It's important to put that positive energy into it. And so definitely as you write your affirmations, I know some people that might be on are probably in like a large group. So you might not all have access to a computer, but type in any affirmations that you guys come up with. And we would love to read them and share them with everyone. So I would also recommend not only writing down these affirmations, um, but sharing them with people that you think might need it. Uh, My roommate, my best friend as well, (laughs) my roommate. um, I kind of introduced affirmation to her as well. And so (laughs) we were kind of just standing in the mirror and saying them. There was a time where we were going through a really rough midterm period last semester. And so a lot of our affirmations just had to do with, you know, working on ourselves, believing that we're capable, believing in ourselves, um, and taking that time to, school is important, but taking that time to make sure you balance your school stress and your life, because it's important to make sure that your well-being is put first. (laughs) Mrs. Beverly says, all my affirmations come from rappers, LOL. I can't stop, won't stop, Diddy. Take some lyrics, take some lyrics. The affirmations don't actually have to be, start with I, and they don't have to be from you. Take your favorite rapper. 
say your favorite rapper and use that as an affirmation as well. I also recommend, you know, looking at taking passages from books that you like. Um, look at some of your favorite authors. Find a, you know, a quote from there, write it down, make it pretty in special font and put that up as well. Ms. Forbes says, mine lately is abundance flows to me with ease and grace. I love that one. I might take that one. I might still have one for mine. Abundance flows to me with ease and grace. And honestly, your affirmation might change throughout the day. Say you wake up really stressed about a test. Your affirmation might be focused on, my God, I know the material. Or, I am prepared. And you finish the test and it's like, I'm awesome. I rock, you know, <laughs> doing things like that. And even if you're unable to, to reach the chat and share one, share them in the spaces that you're in right now. If you're alone, share it with your mom, text your mom, text your mom an affirmation. You know, talk to your friends that are next to you, anything like that. Use them to create a community, use them to support each other. Ms. Smiley says, I'm grounded and divinely supported as I pursue my passions. Ms. Forbes says, I matter. And that's all you need. It does not need, I matter. I love all of these that I'm seeing in the chat. I see one that says, I am enough. And another one that says, I am constantly in flow. I like both of those. I'm enough is very, a very important one. Sitting in yourself, knowing that, you know, no matter what you're going through, you do not need anything else. You are enough as you are. And I'm constantly in flow. I know personally, uh, something I struggle with is anxiety. And so I like to come up with affirmations that help me to at least, you know, attempt to calm my mind sometimes when it's racing. I speak abundance and wholeness in my life and for those around me. Ms. Candace said that one. I think so far of the ones I've seen in the chat, my favorite is abundance flows to me with ease and grace. I really like that one. And so as you continue to write these, just make sure to put them somewhere safe, open a notes app, open a notes app, write them down, continue to make a list of them. And honestly, I just came up with an idea for myself. I think I'm gonna start keeping track of them, you know, digitally so that when I need them again, I can go back, choose, which, choose one for the day. Maybe write out a couple so that you don't have to, in those times where you do need one, you don't necessarily need to go through it and, Make one up yourself. You can already have one set up. Uh, what's, your, what's your favorite song right now? What are you listening to? Take a lyric from that. Affirmations don't necessarily have to be you know, off the cuff or start with I. Give me from your favorite piece of media, uh, a movie quote, a book title, uh, a song lyric, anything of that kind of sort. <laughs> 
<laughs> Miss Beverly says, all I need is one mic, Nas. <laughs> Favorite rapper, again. Listen to Diddy, listen to Nas. Listen to what they have to say. <laughs> And so as you finish up, you know, writing, finish up sending a couple more in the chat. Uh, I hope you can take this with you. Remember to do that self-care Q&A. It's important. Check in with yourself. All right? You matter. You are enough. You rock. So please. Yes. yes. This is great. Thank you. And thank you for reading mine. <laughs> I love the NAS quote. Love it. Oh. All my, really, all my affirmations. I mean, for those of you that don't know in the audience, I'm a DJ, so I think music. So I think that's why um, my affirmations come from those spaces. But I'm always quoting like my husband's uh, jokes that Jay Z is my mentor because I'm always <laughs> quoting. <laughs> so, but there are they're great. You know, you know, as a as a music connoisseur, I'd say that there are a lot of great affirmations in music. So. It means though that you got you got to deepen your 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 palate, making sure that you're listening to things that have messaging and meaning. So yeah, I love that. I love this whole conversation. Um, I was really inspired by um, a lot of uh, what you guys talked about. I don't know if Shanice is still with us. Um, if she is, can we bring her back to stage as well so we can close out? I maybe we're missing her. I'm not sure. Anyway. Um, Okay, thank you. Uh, she's not with us anymore, but I want to thank you so much for sharing um, this. I'm very proud of you. Um, you know, as a, as a mentor, just watching you all grow um, into the young women that you're becoming is amazing to um, to witness. And I'm also glad that you all are so your generation in particular, and everyone in the audience too. You guys are really so solution oriented. Um, I'm not that you know we weren't obviously. I started Black Girls Rock, so um, there's something, but I, I think that really kind of tackling issues that have been gnawing at us for so long is an important mm -hmm. step. And I think the book is really a great way to address it, to create allyship, um, to also recognize self-esteem issues that we personally have dealt with for so long because of uh, societal messaging that told us that we weren't enough. So I kudos to you and congratulations um, you know, on, on this and everything. And so what we are going to do, um, for Saturday is, and I hope you can participate is we're going to rebroadcast this on our YouTube channel. Um, for everyone out there, we are going to have a rebroadcast of this conversation. Um, and we're going to have, a um, it's going to be on Black Girls Rock YouTube. I assume that there's a, um, I can't see what the audience is seeing, but I'm hoping that they were seeing a slide that tells them where to go on Saturday at 3 p.m. Um, and we're hoping that you can join us in the chat. We'll have an opening DJ, DJ Sophia. Um, he's a little uh, budding little rock star herself. Um, so um, we'll, and we'll announce it on all of our social channels. I wanna thank everyone again. Uh, thanks Shanice and thank you so much, Olivia. Uh, thank you everyone thank you. for and our team um and we will see you next month or next or saturday uh for the rebroadcast